So what did Jesus say and do? Um, if someone from the future were to return in time to now, uh, where we are, and randomly ask people what they most think about, she or he would hear a lot of insecurity and anxiety about people's economic situation, loss of jobs or fear of it, foreclosures on their own, diminution, diminishment of their life-saving, fear about losing health insurance, fear for their children's future. This is the kind of thing somebody would hear about, right? They would hear discussed about politicians, unresponsiveness of governments, the, all those banks and corporations. It would be even more overwhelming if talking with the disadvantaged, uh, they talked with the disadvantaged in third world countries today. So that's the kind of thing people would talk about. They wouldn't be talking about religion by and large, but the practical stuff of their life. Okay, what has changed since the days of Jesus? Basic injustice, abuse of others, etc., etc., etc. Now, if Jesus did not have these concrete things in the forefront of his mind and heart, uh, then I say he has little to say to me. Over time, people, we have to teach, tell people this. The radicality of Jesus' message and behavior has been domesticated, betrayed, undermined, distorted, destroyed, thereby condoning the status quo of violence. Huh? Yeah. Walter Winkus said, a scripture scholar, that Jesus had to be real because no one could invent him. No one could invent him. What he thought and said is so radical and the whole package. No one could have thought him up. I'm inclined to agree with that. Christians find it easier to put Jesus on a pedestal worship him, then to walk in his footsteps and do what he did, and paying the price to do that. You know? uh, Jesus was raised as a Jew. He inherited the Jewish covenant of the chosen people. Now, in his day, most Jews, experiencing how messed up this world was in their day, his day, and seeing how most people in his day suffered under occupation, oppression, they believed that God was going to come to clean up the mess human beings had made and bring in a reign of peace, an end to violence, hate, greed, domination, all that stuff. That everyone would live in peace. They believed it would happen on this earth. The belief was not about evacuation of a destroyed earth, or that God was going to destroy the earth, for some new location out there called heaven. It was about the transformation of this world we are living in right now. Transformation of the physical world, they believed. You know, fruitfulness, abundant food and drink. About the animal world, uh, wild animals will get along with each other, be playmates with children. Uh, the social world, there would be an end of the invasions that they had experienced over their history as Jewish people. End of violence and war and occupation and hate and greed. It was about social transformation. That's what Jewish people were looking to that had some envisionment of a coming of a Messiah. And so we can understand how many of them believed that the Messiah would be a general king leading an armed rebellion. That's what they were thinking God was going to do. Well, here are some vignettes about Jesus in this grounding we're talking about. He began his public life proclaiming the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God, or good modern uh, English gives us the word kingdom to grasp what he was meaning. He meant it in the way people of his day understood God's transformation of this planet Earth. Heaven is this world. The king, kingdom of God is this world transformed. Uh, Jesus believed it was possible. Why else would he be banging his head and even risk his life if he did not believe that was possible? This world. 
Jesus proclaims a God who is total agape, love, compassion, healing, forgiveness. Unlike his mentor, John the Baptist, and some others, he did not proclaim a vindictive God, a punishing God. That is not Jesus. God is not a destroyer in Jesus' experience of God. God is total agape. This is utterly radical, and most people just, you know, it's not on their radar. This is my commandment, love one another the way I have loved you. That's how people know you're my followers. This means every human being, every friend, every enemy. God is a loving parent, papa, mama. Jesus called him that. God does not punish, but rather calls us to reestablish the bond of love with one another. You know, that image of the prodigal son who returns home is it's just so utterly powerful. The father goes out to, to meet the son that has wasted half of the father's life savings for his two kids and their offspring. In the patriarchal society, the father would never go out to meet anybody, any son. The father goes out and hugs him. He doesn't even get his feel out. The father's hugging him. Quick, put the best robe and slippers on. We're going to have a feast, a party like we ain't never seen because my son was lost and his father was dead. It's come to life. That's God. That's Papa, Mama, God. Period. You know? That's utterly radical. There is no value vengeance. Jesus calls us to be like God. In the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, which is so powerful, you know, uh, the Beatitudes are really a political platform. How we treat one another in community. It covers the rights of women, respect for all others, the, the powerless, sweeping demands of love. It's a political platform. In all of this, he was thinking society, societally as well as individually. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you as he confronts violence. Jesus presents us with the first recorded account in history of a mechanism of projection. Why do you see the speck in your brother or sister's eye and you don't see the log in your own? It was a genius on so many levels. Near the beginning of his public life, he was invited to speak in the synagogue in Nazareth. Pulls out Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. God has sent me to proclaim good news to the poor, liberty to captives, to set the downtrodden free. He sounds like a flaming revolution. I mean, it is that unbelievable. You know? Jesus' concept of bringing in the kingdom of God is what we today call nonviolent revolution. That's what it is that he called for. The Good Samaritan parable, absolutely stunning. Think of the person you most despise, where your very body reacts against that person or a group, a person of that group. Try to do that. Who is the person you most have resistance toward, despise, uh, um, antagonism, anti-good feelings? That's the very person who you're driving in the southwest on vacation, your car breaks down in the desert, uh, band, uh, uh, your bandits come and beat you half dead, steal everything you got. This person you most have a revulsion in your very body toward is the one who picks you up, takes you to the closest clinic, and shells out cash. You know, genius. That is utter genius. The kingdom of God is about an end of bitterness, hate, in thought and deed. Forgive 70 times 7. Jesus was all about empowerment. He gives people the power of his spirit. I give you power. I give you my spirit. You know, in the Sermon on the Mount there, he gives three examples of how ordinary, abused, occupied people, trapped in their daily oppressive situation, could take back their power with nonviolent acts. You know, the first one, turn the other cheek, is all about, if somebody straps you on the right cheek, Turn the other. Do not cringe. Do not cower. Stand tall. You're the beloved of God. And offer the other. You want to hit me here too? I'm not, not going to cower in fear. That's awesome power. 
That's what we are all challenged to do in our lives. He kept saying, don't be afraid. Peter, stop it. Stop being afraid. How can you transform the earth? If you live in fear, you can't. He keeps challenging us. The greatest must serve the other. Wash their feet. Unlike the kings of the earth who lorded over their subjects, they love to have their importance felt. He compares kings who run tribes, institutions, countries to these disciples, these women and men disciples who are to be the leaders, to, to, to be the influence in the movement. That's social. That's political. Um, this is agape love. You know, you know, Gandhi is the one who invented the term for this nonviolence. Nonviolence is this agape, this active, positive, courageous, unbelievable uh, power that Gandhi says that is the meaning of nonviolence. It is all of, of that. In his words about the rich, Jesus expresses tremendous anger. The words, you know, real anger. In his day, the rich were the small class that ripped off others. They could not be rich without being a part of ripping people off. It was very clear. His day. They gave loans to the poor folk for them to try to pay their bills knowing they won't be able to and then the, their land is foreclosed and the rich hoping to get that property even when they make the loan. That kind of stuff. Sound familiar? Yeah. And in the story of the rich young man, Jesus quotes the commandment, you know, the Ten Commandments, what you should do. But he adds in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not defraud. That's not in there. It's not in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not defraud. He was talking to this rich man, very pointedly. He tells him to sell what he has to give to the poor. It's not about charity, it's about justice. You have ripped people off, you must give it back to the poor. Then you're able to be part of this Jesus movement. That's what he was saying. And Jesus, in challenging the rich, also loves them, is compassionate toward them, even as he confronts them. The story of Dives and Lazarus, powerful, expresses his rage toward the rich. The rich man could not even tune in to the horror of Lazarus outside his gate. The dog licks his wounds. He has no con conscience, no compassion. And that is so unbelievable uh, and not acceptable. And Dives is thrown out of this kingdom where he doesn't fit. Jesus says how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because if they entered this way, this Jesus movement, the way it became called movement, they're working against the very principle of sharing that is key in the kingdom. So, you know, they'll destroy the kingdom with their greed and domination. They don't fit. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about torture them, beyond what the CIA has ever created in the power to torture human being, has nothing to do with that. Since they, they're destructive of the shared community, they, they just don't fit. There has to be a tra transformation of heart and mind of the rich to be able to be a part of the kingdom of sharing. He called for a radical restructuring of society. Another key aspect of this, doing away with all debt. There was the debt code. Jesus calls upon doing away with all debt. You know, every year, in the, uh, seven years in the Jewish law, um, all debt, the books were wiped clean. You don't owe any more. Get back to a level playing field that way. Um, every 50th year, you can reclaim your old ancestral home that you lost this past 50 years through debt. And it's yours again. A clear, you know, talk about justice and distribution of resources. That's in the Mosaic Law. Jesus calls upon that and takes it further. If someone asks of you, give it to them. And don't expect it back. Get rid of all debt. It's distributive justice he's talking about. Not some just spiritual piety. He's talking about distributive justice. 
take care of each other in the village. All the villages under Roman occupation, people poor. Someone asks you give, and that way, what everyone has is shared, and you survive together under occupation in your tongue. That's it's social dust justice. Build the new and the shell of the old. The stories of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes captures this. The miracle is the opening up of hearts of people that did bring food among the 5,000 quote men, among women and children, so the way it's put in the uh, patriarchal language of, uh, of the time. People shared, and there were seven baskets full. If people truly share, there's enough for all. That's the meaning of the multiplication of the loaves. As part of get rid of all debt, there is sharing. So he established a shared community. He began a custom of a shared kind of meal. Everybody welcome. Those leaders in particular uh, uh, didn't like it because he was inviting all the rejects, all the rejects, the unclean, the ones uh, that we can't stand, make us uncomfortable. They are all welcome. And so are the Sadducees, Pharisees, scribes, meaning the priests, politicians, and wealthy of Jesus' day. Everyone, all are welcome in this place. His common meals. You know. Why did Jesus move to the Sea of Galilee as he began his public life? To, to, to Capernaum. Because it was the seat of the biggest economic activity in Galilee. Jesus strategically chose to be where the unjust economic activity was taking place with the taxing of the boats, tax on the fish caught, paying for a license to fish, paying for a harbor spot for your boat. King Herod got rich off of this. He conducted campaigns of nonviolent direct action. He cured the man with a withered hand on the Sabbath, really in his public life, in the synagogue, deliberately making the point of the injustice of the leaders not caring. And want, they're wanting to hold on to power. Why couldn't he just have waited to sundown, the end of the Sabbath, and he could heal the guy's hand? Why did he have to do it there? Because he was making a point. He was doing direct action. He was violating the basic, you know, turf of the power structure of the synagogue. His procession into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, that was political action. That's the day that Herod, uh, I mean Pilate, came in pompously with reinforcement of troops because it was the high holy days and you know these Jews in the uh, Roman Empire were around really. <laughs> and so he comes in pompously with reinforcements of his troops. So Jesus on that day comes in the, on a procession on a jackass spoofing the whole thing being a, an alternative to that dominative display of power and empire. He's doing direct action. The cleansing of the temple, direct action, unlawful, condemning the debt of thieves, you know. It was also, you know, it was civil disobedience, and that was a key thing in the trial. You know? The cross, what is that? That's capital punishment, the electric chair of his day. He was put to death because he was a threat to the empire, and a threat to the Jewish leaders' collaboration with Rome. They were getting rich and powerful off of collaborating with Rome, like Herod was up in Galilee, King Herod, you know, kissing the behinds of the power structure, so you keep getting ahead. The cross was the electric chair of his day. You, know. you can't get any more political than that. And, of course, the resurrection of Jesus by God. God is saying Jesus is right and the church and state are wrong. God is right, and Jesus is right, and the church and state are wrong. That's the message of God. I don't think he was envisioning big cities and big government. He was a country boy in that sense of village life. Didn't hang out in the city, really. Went there when he had to, uh, where there is the centralization of power, and patrons making decisions, doling out to people what they need. I don't think he really believed in that. Jesus was building the new and the shell of the old and doing nonviolent resistance in it all. So that's the first point I wanted to make. Um, the second, okay, 
Well, well, well excuse me, part of my summary again. We need to teach these truths of all Jesus to ordinary Christians, ordinary Christians, uh, to counter the deceptive avoidance that projects the status quo.